Hey everyone, Mr. Murphy here. I'm going to be taking a look at 7.3, which is all about the control of the cell cycle process. This is uh, sort of a short section in terms of the chapter notes and slides, although I would argue that it's probably the most important for us with regards to this material, just because this is where we take the process of the cell cycle and mitosis, and we go a good bit deeper than what we have probably seen in the past in the previous biology class. So. Um, like I said, this will be quick, but all of it is, I think, important and relevant information to make sure you understand. So the reproduction of any cell is not just a process that's continuously happening, which I don't think that's probably news to us. Um, the idea that a cell goes through this long interphase and then mitosis and then cytokinesis and then now it's two cells, it's not necessarily going to immediately replicate again and replicate again and replicate again otherwise we'd be you know massively increasing our sizes or splitting into multiple people all the time and that doesn't happen so um it, some some uh, important things up front first off is this word growth factors sometimes called gfs you see this pop up a lot it's sort of this ambiguous term that gets thrown around really it's just referring to the specific signals that are promoting the process of division of cells. So anytime you see anything that's mentioned as being a growth factor, just understand that to be a, a cog in the grand machine of what leads to cells to divide. So in our cell cycle, there's four different uh, main sections that we see. So you can divide this in a few different ways. So we have interphase versus mitosis. So that's like two um, big sections. But then within interphase, we're familiar at this point with the fact that there's three different sort of sub phases of interphase that are important to distinguish just because of, of what's happening inside of the cell. Interphase really just refers to basically the time that the cell is not actively splitting itself. Um, but when we say interphase, usually to mean a cell that's just like doing cell things, usually what we're actually referring to is the G1 or GAP1 part of interphase, which is, which is here. And you can see how there's a little offshoot and this cell's just hanging out here. So we call this G0, and it's basically just a suspended state of division. It's not dividing, it's, it's being a cell, it's doing normal cell things wherever this is in the body, it's just serving its role, um, its intended function in the body and uh, sometimes cell types hit that g0 and they never go back into the cycle they they are what they are they're not going to divide um, different types of cells in our nervous system for example do this but then there's other examples like liver cells that might hang out in a g0 state for like a year at a time um, on average than reproducing once a year. So it, it's basically, it's nice in a diagram like this to see it as a little offshoot, but it, it's not like the cell's physically moving around in a circle. So just understand what it means in the diagram that this is just hitting pause on the process of division for whatever length of time it happens to be. Um, S phase is all about the synthesis of the DNA. G2 then is that is that last gap phase, and we'll see that there's an important sort of checkpoint here that happens before the cell commits to the process of mitosis, which is the division of the nucleus. And then this little sliver of blue here is this is uh, cytokinesis. So throughout this, there's different restriction points. And in truth, there's many different restriction points all over the place. All these really mean is checkpoints to make sure that the appropriate things have happened or the appropriate signals are present to uh, actually want the cell to continue forward. The first one that's labeled right here at the end of G1 is a really important one because this is basically the checkpoint that's saying, do we want to divide our cell or are we ready to divide our cell? Like any of the list of reasons um, that, uh, you know, at this point, we're just a cell. We're doing cell things. We haven't committed to the idea of, of dividing. And so it's a good place to sort of halt and make sure that the appropriate things have happened in order for us to even begin the process of dividing. Because once you're into the S phase and the DNA begins to get replicated, you're committed as a cell. You are either going to divide or you're gonna die trying, like literally. Uh, and once you're in S phase, then additional checks need to happen. Did we divide the synthesis or do we divide the, the newly synthesized DNA properly? Um, that's an important thing before we move on. Then there's a whole swarm of proteins responsible for making sure that process occurs. 
uh, correctly. And we'll learn more about this in our genetics unit when we actually dive into like how replication of DNA actually occurs. But for right now, that's a good place to be. Just understanding that, yeah, there's a lot of proteins involved. We need all the right proteins in the right places that need to be doing their jobs. And we need to make sure that we have two identical copies of our DNA or as identical as possible. Because when we get to mitosis and we split into two cells at the end of that, you want them to be the same cells. You don't want these to be genetically unique cells. This chapter and this section is all about how do we divide cells to create identical copies. Um, during G2, then again, additional checks to make sure that all the correct sort of pieces and parts are, are there before we get to mitosis. Because when mitosis begins during prophase and prometaphase, we're breaking down the nucleus. The nucleus is gone. So at that point, there's very little the cell can really do. The DNA is all condensed into chromosomes. It's not accessible for transcription of new proteins and things like that. And so you can imagine, like, at that point, the cell has very little control over what's going on. So we need to make sure that uh, that everything is is there that is needed. Um, of course, I mean, there's lots of things still actively happening in terms of like the growing of different cytoskeleton components of the spindle fibers and all of that kind of stuff. But hopefully you get what I mean in terms of the fact that uh, if there's some enzyme that's needed that doesn't exist inside of the cell, once you hit mitosis, there's really no means of getting that because of the way in which the chromosomes are all wrapped up, the nucleus is, is disappearing, um, and it's just a sort of a breakdown of normal cell function, which is why that has to happen very quickly. So how does all this happen? It, it's, this, it's the same general story we've been seeing in terms of there are signals that trigger that transition from one thing to the next to the next. It's a really good example of that signal transduction that we've seen before where one molecule activates the next one which activates the next one which activates you know potentially six other things in order to keep the cell moving in one continual direction of chemical processes so there's different evidence um, the book presents some cool experiments that uh, have demonstrated how we even understand that this is actually true um, and so one of those examples is they took two cells one that was in the S phase, so in the process of replicating its DNA, and fused it with uh, another cell that was just in that resting G1 state before it had begun to divide. Um, and you can do this chemically using different uh, mechanisms to basically weaken and, and cause these cell membranes to adhere together. And when that happened, what they showed was that uh, immediately the, the DNA inside of this nucleus in the G1 uh, part of the cell uh, began to replicate. And so what that demonstrated was that there were, in fact, chemical molecules inside of the S phase cell that uh, were responsible for progressing that forward. So it wasn't just like an external si uh, signal that had landed on the S phase, but that something inside of this cell has changed and, and chemicals are, are present and able to cause the process of replication. So we understand this now as being the responsibility of basically two molecules, a molecule called cyclin um, and a molecule called cyclin-dependent kinases. So CDK's cyclin-dependent kinase. This is a kinase, which means it's something that's going to phosphorylate other um, proteins and, and activate them or deactivate them or whatever, change their shape in a meaningful way. And it is called cyclin-dependent because it depends upon this molecule cyclin. And so a CDK is, a, is a, basically just an enzyme waiting to do its job. And when a cyclin comes in and changes the conformation and the shape of that CDK, that CDK becomes activated. The cyclin-CDK complex together becomes active and then passes on the signal forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, uh, that's what I just said, the cyclin alters its shape, exposes its act active site. And so an example would be between G1 and S, we have a cyclin CDK complex that is the trigger that actually pushes the cell into the S phase. And it does a whole bunch of things in terms of activating the enzymes and proteins responsible for the process of DNA replication, but then also going back and sort of deactivating the things that were holding the cell in G1 um, and deactivating the things that were progressing the cell from G1 to S phase. So it sort of pushes the cell forward, but then goes back and stops the process that was happening before. Uh, and in that way, it ensures that the cell continues moving in just one direction. Uh, 
And uh, I'll use this diagram to sort of explain that a little further. So there's the cyclin CDK complex at this restriction point that pushes the cell forward. And then part of that is actually to go back and sort of break down that cyclin. Because when the cell moves on to the S phase here, we don't want this cyclin, the one responsible for pushing the cell from G1 to S, we don't want that just hanging out. Because otherwise when the cell gets to the end of the process and divides, that cyclin would still be there and would immediately start causing the, the next division to occur. And so throughout these, uh, these different steps, whenever we see a cyclin CDK push the cell forward, it's also going to be pumping the brakes on sort of its own activity. So that way cells aren't just uh, un in an uncontrolled fashion moving past those checkpoints after the division has occurred. Um, something else that the book doesn't really dive into too thoroughly is the fact that while there's labeled CDKs here, um, this is showing a particular CDK. This is showing the CDK responsible for G1 to S. And so it's just tracking that one. And you notice the CDK is always there. CDKs don't come and go. They're always available. They're just, they're just sitting there unactivated because they don't have their cyclin. So we destroy the cyclin after it has activated it. And now there's no cyclin there. There's no cyclin, no cyclin, no cyclin. And then we're back to the G1. And it wouldn't be until the next growth factor has come along to create uh, this cyclin or make this cyclin available that the cell would then go into its next division. Um, now there's also separate checkpoints and the three that we talk about are this one here at the end of G1. We talk about one between S phase and G2 which is where essentially it's a separate CDK and a separate cyclin that is only generated once this process of DNA synthesis has happened correctly. And so once you have your complete set of DNA, it's been checked by all sorts of proteins responsible for looking for errors and swapping out nucleotides that might be connected funny. Um, at once that is all present and has all occurred, then a new cyclin that matches that CDK will come along, hit that CDK, and push it forward towards mitosis. And so just like however here, the cyclin end, ends up getting destroyed, this second cyclin and CDK over here, the second cyclin would, uh, would also get destroyed. Um, the, the process would continue. And then the third checkpoint that we talk about is right at the middle of mitosis, which is uh, like the metaphase checkpoint. And basically what that is, is making sure that the chromosomes have all been captured by the spindle fibers and that they are all lined up at the center of the cell. Uh, which is a super cool process. It's, it's way more in depth than, than what we cover in this course. Um, but it is important to understand that there is a third CDK that we talk about that would be present and would be waiting for a cyclin to be uh, freed up and attached to it, um, it before the cell actually progresses into anaphase. And so it creates this little delay of enabling those different uh, cytoskeleton components of the spindle fibers to grab on and line up the chromosomes in the middle because we don't want to start pulling things apart if like one of the chromosomes is just over here and hadn't been attached to anything yet. And so that's another example of a checkpoint, making sure that the appropriate things have happened during the process of metaphase in mitosis before we continue on. And just like before, once that CDK finds its cyclin, it leads to the cell moving forward with anaphase but also leads to that cyclin being destroyed. Cyclins are named cyclins because they are created and destroyed every cycle of the cell life cycle. And so it's not a very creative name, but it's an effective one just to remind us that the cyclins come and go. They are on a constant cycle of being created and being destroyed. Um, they're created only when the process has happened appropriately and only when they are ready to move on to the next phase and then they are promptly destroyed because you don't want those lingering in a cell that has already finished its division process because it could be activating those CDKs at the wrong time when we, when we maybe don't want to be dividing our cell or we're not ready to progress to the next phase. And so a cyclin appears, does its job, gets destroyed, and then the cell uh, is able to do this all in a very controlled fashion. I'm repeating myself a whole bunch because it's important and I wanna make sure we understand. Um, but what I'm, what I'm describing here 
um, is, is three different checkpoints. This diagram only shows us one. So there are three that we par particularly focus on, G1 to S, the S to G2 phase, and then the M phase, uh, the M restriction point in the middle of, of mitosis. Um, there are many more uh, for the, the more nuanced specific actions that need to happen, but like everything in biology, we focus on some examples to understand sort of the broad strokes of how it works, while also keeping in the back of our mind the fact that all of this is always more complicated. Um, not, not complicated to understand, just complicated in terms of the details that might actually be involved. Um, so the, uh, this, this goes into a little more detail about specifics of how this happens. There's a particular protein called retinoblastoma protein, RB protein. We see that pop up sometimes, so it might be worth knowing. Um, but that's a, that's the protein that's particularly um, relevant to the, the pushing of the cell cycle beyond the G1 to S checkpoint. Um, so RB is normally in inhibiting the cell cycle, but when it gets phosphorylated by that cyclin CDK complex, it no longer is inhibiting it. And so then the cell cycle is allowed to uh, proceed. But um, then remember the cyclin is going to get broken down which means the RB is no longer going to be continuously phosphorylated by this cyclin CDK, and so then the brakes sort of get put back on once the RB is, is free to do its job again. So all of this is just to achieve what it says up here, precise control so that cells are dividing when we want them to um, in a, a chemically controlled fashion. That's the end of that section. As always, if you have questions, let me know.